we're now going to move on to our next presenter, Clay Antio. Clay is a horticulturalist and botanist with SPU, where he's been employed for over 20 years. He's also a longtime instructor and advisor with University of Washington Certificate Program in Wetland Science and Management. And I think this is super cool, Clay, um, is that he's quite active in the Washington Native Plant Society and the Northwest Chapter of the Society for Ecological Restoration. Um, this webinar, Clay will be speaking about science-based strategies to enhance resilience to pests, diseases, and invasive plants, specifically the use of wood chips as a soil amendment to create a more resilient landscape. Thanks, Clay. Great. Well, thank you so much for the invite to present, and uh, I'm uh, I'm excited about wood chips, and I hope uh, by the end of this presentation you'll be as excited as I am. So uh, we're actually just going to be talking about one science-based strategy for promoting healthy plant growth, not uh, numbers of them, although I'll be referring to others. Um, there's uh, a lot of material to cover with regard to wood chips as a soil amendment. and. Uh, uh, this all started for me about 10 years ago. I had, a, I guess, an epiphany or an awakening or a revelation with regard to wood chips that I could actually incorporate them into soil without the world having coming to a catastrophic end. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were identifiable benefits from doing that. And then um, after getting into the science around wood in soil, um, I got really excited about um, that science and I uh, thought I'd put together a presentation which um, sort of lays out that science for folks uh, and talks about how wood chips could be used much more effectively uh, in our work as gardeners, as landscape designers, um, horticulturists, uh, and restorationists. And so this uh, presentation talks about that, and uh, we'll um, be speaking of many things today, uh, but I just want to mention uh, uh, hang on a second here. There we go. I want to mention that the talk is based around <clears throat> three observations that I've made as a longtime practitioner in the Puget Sound region. Uh, the first is that uh, there are limiting factors that are seem to be completely off the radar for most people doing restoration or gardening or landscape horticulture. Uh, and those um, limiting factors um, tend to focus on depleted soil organic matter, soil compaction, and poorly developed soil food webs. Uh, that is to say when people are uh, gardening or designing landscapes or restoring um, degraded environments, soil seems to be uh, among the last things that they think about, if they think about it at all. And so this is uh, one of the observations on which this presentation is founded, and we'll talk more about what uh, wood chips can do to help get these topics on the radar and to allow you to do a, um, a better job of uh, practicing your craft. Um, the second observation on which this presentation is founded is that the current use of wood chips is based on misconception and narrow understanding of the function of wood in and on soil. And this is largely related to a myth that most of us live with, um, and I think you'll know what I'm talking about when we get to this point. But that myth has been strongly constraining in terms of how we practice our craft here and to the detriment of, of that craft. And then uh, the third and last observation that I would make about um, what, uh, what we do here in the Pacific Northwest and through other places in the uh, North American continent is that <clears throat> if we thought more deeply about how wood chips perform in soil, a greater strategic use of that material in ecosystem restoration and ornamental landscapes really has the potential to importantly transform those industries. Uh, and um, uh, this is one of the major points that I'd like to uh, get across in this presentation today. Uh, importantly transforming uh, the industries uh, and your individual practice as practitioners of landscape design, gardening, uh, restoration. So a brief outline of what we'll talk about today will include definitions, just to make sure everybody's uh, on the same page with regard to what wood is, what bark is, and a number of other uh, important um, terms that come to play in this 
discussion. We'll talk about the benefits of wood chips as a soil amendment, get those sort of out of the way fairly quickly, and then I'll be focusing on the, on the biological benefits of wood chips for much of the remainder of the talk. <clears throat> we'll talk about that myth that I just mentioned about incorporating wood into soil, uh, and um, the myth is that if you incorporate wood into soil, that, that will rob soil nitrogen to the detriment of the plants that are growing there. We'll uh, uh, tear into that a little bit and explain uh, in better detail uh, the phenomenon that this myth refers to um, and then also explore why it is a myth in some regards. Uh, we'll talk about a natural model for wood in soil. Um, as we seek to understand the importance of wood, it's important to know how wood functions naturally in natural ecosystems and we can learn a lot from uh, an under understanding there. We'll talk about a real world demonstration of benefits. So uh, just to um, uh, show that it's, this isn't just a, a clay thing, uh, there are many other people that are beginning to discover the benefit of incorporating wood chips as a soil amendment. And I'll give you three examples from the real world uh, where this is the case, um, and which substantiate my uh, contention that wood chips is uh, being well underused uh, in practice. And then I thought I'd just explain a little bit about my own personal discovery of wood chips as a soil amendment, how I came to uh, think about wood chips differently in my practice and how uh, it's importantly transformed what I've done in restoration and gardening landscape design. So let's get into some of the definitions first. <clears throat> let's make sure that we all are talking about the same thing. So uh, just some basics here. Mulch, most of us know that the mulch are materials placed on the soil surface. Those can be organic or inorganic materials. Um, mulches have uh, specific purposes that I'll talk about in a minute, but those are materials placed on the soil surface. As opposed to a soil amendment, which are materials that are incorporated into the soil profile and specifically to improve soil physical, chemical, and biological properties. So um, as we talk about soil, it's uh, useful to keep in mind that um, physical, chemical, and biological properties are sort of the functional um, categories of soils. And so it's um, a useful way to sort of think about uh, the complexity of soil. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about uh, soil characteristics in terms of physical, chemical, and biological properties. So soil amendments being incorporated into the soil profile to improve soil physical, chemical, and biological properties. <clears throat> and then lastly, uh, in this side, uh, soil food webs. Uh, I think uh, we all understand what that refers to. Um, if we specifically define it, it's a community of soil organisms interacting with each other and their non-living soil environment. And um, this is a, a really emergent uh, aspect of science uh, these days, and I would say that uh, as a society, we have just really a rudimentary understanding of what soil food webs are and what they do. Um, but uh, we understand that they're very complex and very important for plant life and human life. And um, might be worth uh, explaining a little further what uh, soil food webs are. So, you know, a lot of stuff lives in the soil. Um, and we're talking about the wee beasties primarily, but not just the wee beasties, also um, larger and visible organisms such as crustaceans, millipedes, centipedes, worms, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, largely the soil food web is driven by wee beasties that we really can't see with the naked eye. So things like bacteria or um, archaea, the ancient bacteria, protists, which are more advanced um, single cell organisms, and then you've got fungi including actinomycetes, which are the yeast. Uh, and molds, the basidiomycetes, which are the mushroom type fungi, nematodes, and arthropods, I just mentioned, plus algae, lichens, and plant roots. So there's just a lot of players going on in the soil food web. They're all interacting with each other. Um, it's dog eat dog, so to speak, as everybody is trying to make a living uh, and uh, consuming whatever uh, food they can to sustain their lives and reproduce. As a result of those interactions, uh, you have um, a lot of processes that are uh, displayed, important processes uh, with regard to um, soil health, plant growth, uh, human existence, things like uh, the decomposition of residue, decaying plant and animal matter. Um, soil food webs are, are driving how nutrients enter 
uh, soil food web system and how those nutrients then are cycled through it. Soil food webs have important roles to play in how soil aggregates and how porous soil is. So soil aggregation and porosity, important processes resulting from soil food web activity. Um, soil food webs transform contaminants, um, uh, pollutants such as uh, uh, heavy metals and um, oil, hydrocarbon related contaminants, as well as many other things. Soil food webs are important for fixing nitrogen, taking nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and converting it into ammonia forms um, and nitrate and nitrite forms that are available then to other organisms, including plants. Soil food webs uh, are known to uh, sequester large volumes of carbon, meaning that that carbon being is locked up in the soil rather than being released back into the atmosphere. And of course, that's an important variable if you're interested in climate change discussion. Uh, we know that soil food webs interact importantly with plants and enhance root function. There's an important feedback mechanism there between the plants themselves and the, the organisms in the soil food web. And in fact, as I'll we'll point out later in the presentation, uh, plants can importantly influence who is um, promoted and who is demoted in the soil food web in that root zone environment. And plus, you got lots of other things going on in the soil food web. You got predators. Um, as I mentioned, everybody's trying to eat everybody else, and uh, pathogens, both plant pathogens as well as other pathogens, the um, organisms that live in uh, that soil food web. So it's a very complex um, ecosystem underfoot, and we're just beginning to understand um, those interactions and just how important they are uh, in many ways to uh, plant growth and um, human and animal existence for those of us that live above the ground. Uh, I'll just say that um, a diverse soil food webs support healthy plant growth, uh, and that's uh, literally a series of lectures on its own. Um, we know that the occurrence of pathogenic bacteria and fungi are low in healthy plant populations uh, living in a diverse soil food web environment. Um, so uh, if you promote a healthy soil food web environment, you can actually do a lot to minimize the presence of pathogenic bacteria and fungi, and pathogens of plants. So um, soil health, uh, in my opinion, um, is a really critical part of integrated pest management, although uh, traditionally um, soil health really hasn't been considered an important aspect of that um, whole concept of IPM. Um, plant defense systems are selective, as I just mentioned, and cause the enrichment of plant beneficial microbes in the environment. We're just beginning to find out just how, how uh, uh, feedbacky this uh, relationship between plants and the soil food web is. But we understand now that it's extremely feedbacky, meaning that plants are able to strongly influence who succeeds and who doesn't in the soil food web environment. So plants can actually promote beneficial bacteria things like saprophytes that degrade organic matter. They can um, promote plant growth, um, uh, uh, beneficial bacteria, rhizobacteria uh, in the root zone, uh, as well as antagonists of plant root pathogens. So plants know what they're doing uh, through the exudation of roots, uh, the root system there, and through um, uh, exudates that come out of plant leaves. So they importantly influence soil food webs. And uh, as I'll point out through the portions of the remainder part of this talk, Healthy soil food webs are critical for healthy plant growth, and particularly if you're trying to manage disease and pests in the environment. Okay, some more definitions then. Thanks for sticking with me on this. Um, you might think you know what wood is, but um, actually wood is a, a very complex topic, um, so to speak. Um, it's a porous and fibrous structural tissue uh, known as secondary xylem botanically. It's derived from the inside of the vascular cambium of stems and roots of woody plants. So vascular cambium is a meristemic, meristematic tissue re re uh, responsible for growth, uh, and you find it in woody uh, stems and roots. Um, and so it's uh, derived from the inside of that. So wood is um, generally a natural composite of cellulose, um, on the order of 41 to 43 percent, sort of on average, uh, in, in a crystalline structure, and uh, as well as hemicellulose, which is like a branched form of cellulose, uh, which is 20 to 30 percent uh, in content of wood. Um, cellulose is arranged in fibers, which uh, provides strength and tension, and those fibers are embedded in a matrix of lignin. 
a, a different uh, carbon-based compound, uh, lignin being about 23 to 27% <clears throat> of the wood. Lignin, uh, in contrast to cellulose, <clears throat> resists compression. So what is it really, uh, from an engineering perspective, uh, a truly dramatic uh, uh, innovation out there? You have this material composed primarily of long chains of carbon um, that are both strong in tension and um, strong under compression. You all know what I'm talking about. Wood is a pretty remarkable structure. Uh, and um, I'll mention here in a second, uh, it was a, a dramatic invention in the evolution of plant life here. Um, there's other stuff in wood. Uh, you've got uh, suberin, which is a kind of wax, tannins, um, which are uh, very bitter things. Uh, complex molecules tend to taste bad to bugs that are trying to eat the wood. And other decomposition-resistant compounds. Um, wood also has other elements besides carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Uh, there is actually nitrogen in wood and about 1% other elements, mainly uh, calcium, potassium, sodium, magnesium, manganese, and iron, uh, but also trace amounts of other things like um, uh, sulfur and um, phosphorus. Now, in contrast, bark is um, similar to wood, but uh, importantly different in a couple of different ways. It's uh, also porous and fibrous. It's a structural tissue, and it's also derived from the vascular cambium in the stems and roots of woody plants, but it's derived from the outside of that meristematic tissue. So obviously it's the, the outside portion of woody stems. It's, it's the uh, portion of the plant that uh, really protects it from uh, the elements and in particular pathogens that might want to consume that plant. So bark is a, a critical a point of protection for plants in that it's um, highly resistant to decomposition and invasion. Um, it's uh, full of stuff that um, doesn't taste good to in organisms that want to eat that plant. In contrast to wood, um, bark is mostly lignin. It has cellulose in it, uh, these polysaccharides uh, that I've been mentioning, um, about 40% lignin, um, also lots of biopolymers, uh, tannins, suberin and suberan kinds of waxes. Uh, as well as other decomposition resistant compounds. Most notably, uh, the presence of condensed tannins. Uh, these are uh, um, um, very complex molecules uh, that um, are often polymerized, meaning that they form these very long chains uh, that are highly resistant to decomposition. Uh, and they're more, much more abundant in wood, uh, excuse me, in bark than in wood. Condensed tannins are used for tanning leather. Um, just to give you an idea of uh, what we're talking about here. So um, bark, similar to wood, but different in that it has more lignin and also um, much more of these uh, materials that are highly resistant to decomposition. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things that's uh, useful to know about bark and wood is that uh, wood is uh, much more easily um, digested by those organisms that digest wood than is bark. So if we look at a, a very simple experiment here where they uh, ran, they ground up wood and bark and they ran it through a number six mesh. Uh, and then they basically um, measured the amount of carbon dioxide that was being produced as uh, those piles of bark and wood degraded uh, as they were being eaten by the organisms that were decomposing it. Um, you can get an idea of sort of how much qu more quickly wood decomposes as opposed to bark. So in this example, um, you'll notice here that um, um, wood tended to emit more carbon dioxide, meaning it was being digested faster than bark uh, in slash pine, white oak, and ponderosa pine. Interestingly, in this experiment, um, the uh, wood of Douglas fir basically uh, decomposed about as quickly as bark did. And in one species, uh, red cedar, um, the bark actually decomposed faster than the wood did, which actually makes some sense if you've ever worked with red cedar, you know that uh, the wood of red cedar is actually infused with lots of essential oils that retard decomposition, uh, things like thuyone and isothuyone, fenchone, and lots of other stuff. So there's some uh, rot resistance in cedar wood, uh, which is showing up in this uh, particular research. But generally speaking, bark takes a longer time to decompose than does wood. 
And this is important if you're talking about the role of wood in soil, if you're actually wanting to feed soil food webs. Uh, and uh, I'll touch on this again in just a bit, but um, if you're trying to feed soil food webs, provide an energy source to power those soil food webs, you really want something that's a little more decomposable than less decomposable. And so generally wood is your, your best choice. But if you can't get wood, then bark will do. It just takes a little longer to decompose. Um, if you really sort of get into the, uh, the literature on this, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. I, I mentioned that wood was a, uh, an important invention in plant evolution. Um, it's uh, one of the first uh, sort of critical inventions uh, in the evolution of plants in that it was able to allow plants to grow bigger than their competition, right? If you have woody stems, that means you can grow much taller, thus get more light uh, and outcompete your, your um, competing uh, vegetation. Um, uh, wood first appears in the fossil record about 370 million years ago during the late Devonian uh, geological period. Um, and then what's more interesting is that uh, uh, the next sort of big invention in plant evolution is the appearance of flowers. Flowers actually are just um, a very, very much a newcomer on the scene, so to speak, in plant evolution. They appeared only about 130 million years ago, uh, as opposed to wood, which appeared 370 million years ago. Um, and then also what's interesting is um, it took about 70 million years for other organisms to figure out how to decompose wood after wood first evolved. So the first evidence of um, uh, wood decomposing organisms appears in the fossil record about 300 million years ago. So that's pretty interesting that there was a very long uh, period of time, literally 70 million years, um, before organisms figured out how to actually digest wood to obtain the energy within those bonds of carbon uh, in those cellulose and lignin molecules. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you, if you, for people that study this stuff intensely, uh, they, uh, they have deduced that it's the 70 million years of time when wood basically wasn't being rotted, decomposed, uh, that contributed largely to the stores of hydrocarbon in the form of coal and oil and gas uh, that we now have tapped uh, as a society for energy purposes. Uh, but once the organisms, organisms figured out how to decompose wood, uh, then uh, that uh, huge amount of material that was just sitting around for millions of years uh, finally began to be um, decomposed, used for energy. So um, if you ask yourself, well, who actually digests wood and bark, you'll find actually the very few organisms do that. Um, so you know that um, just from your own experience that wood and bark, or wood primarily, um, has a lot of energy in it. Those chemical bonds between carbons uh, store just huge amounts of energy. And so if you uh, put a piece of wood on the fire, um, you know what happens, right? Wood burns, gives off huge amounts of light and heat uh, in an uncontrolled combustion reaction. Um, those um, chemical bonds and their energy um, could be a very useful source of energy for organisms in a controlled way. Um, they can take that energy and then use that energy for their own life support, right? But if you look at actually who actually can digest wood and bark, there are very few groups of organisms that do that, and largely because um, there's a, just by the very nature, the long chain uh, complex branched um, nature of the chemicals of cellulose and lignin. Uh, it's just really difficult to do that molecularly. Um, so here, for example, is a, an image of, the, of a lignin molecule. And you'll notice that uh, there are lots of these circular carbon structures. Uh, those are aromatic carbon rings. Uh, those are very difficult to break apart molecularly. You'll also notice that uh, this long chain is um, branched Notice the branches here, and it's also folded. Uh, and then these uh, molecules will polymerize, and so you get long chains of these branched, folded uh, molecules. The end result being that these molecules are really difficult uh, to decompose using things like enzymes. As a result, only a couple of groups of organisms have actually figured out how to do that. Um, and then you got this whole complex uh, crystalline structure where you've got lignin, um, being sort of uh, infused in a crystalline structure with cellulose. So um, the challenge of digesting wood is significant, 
And as I mentioned, just a couple of organisms have actually figured out how to do that. Uh, if I do this uh, session in person, I always ask the question, well, who actually can digest wood and bark, actually get energy from eating bark? And usually the response, as you probably are thinking, is termites, right? Termites eat bark, right? So we know that uh, termites will um, go to wood as an energy source. But in fact, termites don't actually digest wood. They eat wood. They put it in their their mouths, mandibles, and chew it up, and then they put it in their gut. But they don't actually digest it. And we've known for a long time in science that it's actually protists, uh, eukaryotic bacteria, in the guts of termites that actually do the digestion. But in fact, um, that actually is also wrong. Um, it's been discovered recently in the last 20 years. It's not these protists that are actually doing the digestion. Um, it's other um, bacteria that live on and inside these protists that actually have the enzymes capable of breaking wood down uh, and capturing the energy in those chemical bonds and carbons of lignin and cellulose. That's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, these little wee beasties rely on other wee beasties inside and on their bodies to do the actual digestion, uh, so-called endomicrobiota. Uh, and there's a whole emergent area of microbiology that's focusing on uh, these ancient bacteria that are able to um, digest wood uh, and obtain energy from that. So as they're digesting the wood that the termites have masticated, some of that energy becomes available then to the protists and then also to the termites that are housing those proteins. So um, we know that uh, certain bacteria, ancient bacteria, are able to digest wood. And most of us know also that fungus uh, is able to digest wood. Not all fungi, but many of them uh, do have uh, systems that are able to digest wood. I'll also mention that um, fungi are much more efficient uh, in digesting wood than bacteria are. Uh, bacteria do it, but they do it very, very slowly. Uh, whereas um, fungi have these enzyme systems that um, are very effective at basically breaking down cellulose and lignin. Uh, these enzyme-based digestion approaches focus on um, specific enzymes that are designed to break the lignin and cellulose down, so lignase and cellulase. Uh, those result in what we know um, commonly as white rot, they tend to be a moist uh, rot with lots of white mycelial um, evidence visible. Uh, as a, an organism, uh, however, doing enzyme-based digestion is very expensive. Um, it takes a lot of um, energy and resources to basically construct these enzymes. So it's not a, a great system, but it allows fungus to um, access the energy that is in wood. Um, just very recently, in the last, again, about 15 years, it's discovered that um, fungus actually has another um, method for digesting wood. And uh, it's called non-enzymatic chelator-mediated biocatalysis. You want to make a note of that for discussion at the dinner table tonight with your family. So this is actually a, an, uh, a really energetically cheap way of digesting wood. So instead of creating these complex proteins, these enzymes that basically chunk out chunks of the lignin and cellulose and get energy in doing that, uh, what these guys do is um, they uh, generate um, these chelator um, uh, and, uh, ions, primarily iron, and then produce what are called hydroxyl radicals. So um, if you're concerned about um, healthy, young-looking skin, you're probably familiar, like I am, with um, free radicals, right? You want to avoid free radicals if you want to keep your skin looking healthy and young. And so you know that um, free radicals are these um, highly reactive molecules that attack your skin cells and cause it to degrade, to age. So um, there are many products out there on the market that allow you uh, to um, avoid free radicals uh, and to maintain your skin healthy looking. So radicals in the chemical world are these uh, highly reactive, very destructive uh, molecules. And that's what uh, this this biocatalysis method uses. Um, these hydroxyl radicals basically uh, attack the lignin and cellulose, breaking it down into individual building blocks of those um, cellulose and lignin molecules, which is glucose. You probably know that from your basic high school biology, right? So 
um, glucose is uh, is like uh, money in the bank uh, for all for almost any organism. Any organism can use glucose as an energy source, and so instead of uh, um, deconstructing uh, lig lignin and cellulose uh, using enzymes, they basically attack it chemically, and then this, uh, those materials break down into their individual glucose building blocks, and then those building blocks are used for energy. A much more uh, efficient, uh, inexpensive way to do, uh, basically eat wood. So uh, fungi have come up with a couple of uh, very effective ways of accessing the energy in wood, and uh, is as a result of its um, proficiency, an important uh, player in soil food webs where there is wood present as an energy source. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the wood chips as a mulch, just to make sure that we all understand the benefits of that. I'm certainly not uh, uh, suggesting that folks um, uh, stop using wood chips as mulch. Uh, wood chips as a mulch have been commonly used for decades. They're inexpensive, generally, uh, well-known, an effective method to do lots of different things uh, in restoration and uh, landscape horticulture. They suppress weed, um, they conserve moisture, they increase soil organic matter over time as they decompose slowly. They uh, minimize erosion, they buffer soil temperatures, they enhance the landscape aesthetic. That's, that's my own personal um, uh, phrasing there. Uh, and they support uh, fungus-based soil food webs. So lots of good benefits coming from the use of wood chips as a mulch. But my emphasis today in this presentation is the use of wood chips as a soil amendment, so incorporating them into the soil profile and seeking benefits that go beyond uh, what you obtain from just throwing wood chips onto the surface. And uh, one of the first uh, things that I'd like to point out about wood chips as a soil amendment uh, is the physical benefit um, related to mitigating soil compaction. So right off at the top of my presentation, I mentioned that um, Soil compaction was among the um, greatest limiting factors for plant growth, but most people don't even really uh, bother to think about it. Um, uh, but we know uh, from research and experience that soil productivity and physical characteristics are crucial to plant health and ecosystem functioning. Uh, and we know that compaction, um, even minor amounts of compaction, um, such as uh, might be um, obtained by uh, just a couple people walking through a site, um, compacting soil with footprints, is enough to uh, result in uh, measurable um, impacts to plant growth and vigor. <clears throat> we also know that once compacted, soils take a very long time, if ever, to return to pre-compaction physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. Um, and in fact, uh, this would probably be a great presentation, uh, soil compaction, how to mitigate it, uh, for um, other uh, uh, webinars, um, but you don't really see much out there on soil compaction and how it impacts plant growth. I'll just put it out there that it's uh, critical. It's off the radar for most folks. Um, and we uh, know from our own personal experience that um, excessively compacted soils require not just physical intervention, so we're talking about mastication, ripping, or subsoiling, and uh, the images here in this uh, slide show you those uh, devices that are used to physically intervene to mitigate um, soil compaction. You got your, uh, your masticator here, you got your um, ripper device here, and then you got your subsoiler here. Um, uh, this is used on agricultural scales to address soil compaction. But we know that uh, excessively compacted soils require not just that kind of physical intervention, but also the incorporation of wood or other organic matter, and lots of it. Otherwise, um, if you just um, physically intervene by using mastication, ripping, or subsoiling, um, and this has been demonstrated by research as well as our personal experience, um, you basically get soils that recompact to the, to the near same um, densities as prior to that physical intervention. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, most of this uh, research has been focused on uh, the abandonment or restoration of forest roads. So, um, but um, and you know what forest roads are, right? You got these roads that have been in place for um, decades in many cases, excessively compacted. Um, once those roads are done, um, and because they cause problems for managing water in watersheds, uh, it's desirable sometimes to um, 
remove those roads. So uh, I was stationed up at the Cedar River Municipal Watershed near North Bend for Seattle Public Utilities for almost a decade. And we spent a lot of time and money uh, decommissioning old forest roads. And what we um, did typically was we paid a, we'd pay a guy to sit on a, an excavator and uh, have, spend his whole day basically with a thumb and bucket basically ripping up the roadbed of these roads that we were abandoning. We'd come back in uh, after that and plant things up. Uh, that would be my job. And then we'd come back about a year later and discover that all the plants were dead and the road had recompacted essentially to near pre-intervention um, levels. Uh, and we got into the literature a little bit and started talking with folks and people were discovering the same thing, not just uh, here in western Washington, but across the Pacific Northwest and Rocky Mountain region, that if you just go in and physically intervene, you just basically get recompacted soils. You need to incorporate organic material, wood chips, which is more largely the available material that's used in this case, uh, and you need to incorporate that material as you're physically intervening, otherwise you just uh, get recompaction. So in this case, wood chips uh, are a critical piece of um, uh, equipment, so to speak, in addressing excessively compacted soils to avoid that recompaction that happens typically. So um, one of the main physical benefits of wood chips as a soil amendment is uh, that you're able to mitigate soil compaction over a long period of time. There are other physical benefits of including wood chips as a soil amendment, um, and I'll just point out a handful of important ones here. Uh, first, they provide surface and subsurface microtopography, microclimate, and microhabitat in the soil environment. And all of those micro um, characteristics are critical for developing and promoting a um, diverse soil food web. The more microtopography, microclimate, microhabitats you have in the soil environment, the more diversity of soil organisms you're promoting. Um, Adding wood chips as a soil amendment also physically mitigates soil hydrophobia, and I presume you all know what that means. Um, we've all experienced that uh, disheartening event where you're irrigating a plant and the water doesn't appear to actually infiltrate into the soil, but rather runs off as if the soil is um, afraid of infiltrating the water, hydrophobia. So if you actually incorporate wood chips, um, you avoid this hydrophobia phenomenon and allow uh, those soils to be more permeable or uh, infiltratable uh, to water. Uh, wood chips also moderate and stabilize soil temperature and soil moisture, and uh, that benefits plants and soil food webs. If you uh, start doing some of this on your own and you, you come back to the work that you do after you've incorporated wood into the soil, you'll find that if you dig some of that soil up after a growing season that those wood chips are um, basically saturated with water. They're like little sponges. Uh, that water is critical to plant life as well as all the other organisms that are living in the soil. Uh, and that moisture has important roles to play in moderating, stabilizing uh, temperature uh, and moisture and other uh, characteristics of the soil environment. So important physical benefits of wood in soil listed there for you. There are chemical benefits. Um, we know that soils around the world are um, one of the most important places where, car where carbon is sequestered or stored on the earth. And so obviously, if you're, if you're dumping large volumes of wood into the soil, you are uh, enhancing the soil's ability to store that um, carbon. So adding wood uh, enhances soil carbon sequestration. Uh, and also, as I pointed out earlier, uh, wood does have nutrients. Um, so when you add wood, you're um, basically adding additional nutrients that will become available to plants and other organisms over time. Uh, and also the presence of wood chips, because they degrade into um, complex organic molecules like humic and fulvic acids, you also are enhancing the, the soil's ability to sequester and chelate nutrients. That is to say, capture them, hold them in the soil environment, uh, rather than allow them to leach out of the environment. So uh, nutrient sequestration, chelation, all related to cation exchange capacity for those folks who have some soil science in their um, hip pocket. You know what I'm talking about. So uh, wood enhances the ability of soil to stay fertile through the long term. Important uh, if you're trying to encourage good plant growth. And then there are these biological benefits. As I've been mentioning, wood is an energy source. Uh, you can either combust wood in, in an uncontrolled way and get fire 
with heat and light, or if you're a fungus or a bacterium uh, with the right systems, you can actually capture the energy in those chemical bonds in a controlled way and then make a living out of it, right? So um, wood is an important energy source that powers soil food webs, and those soil food webs are dominated by fungi, most of which are mycorrhizal. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, adding wood builds soil biomass and soil organic matter. So when the wood is digested, not all of it is basically uh, degraded to carbon dioxide and water, but a lot of it ends up in these complex organic molecules I just mentioned, fulvic and humic acids, which stay in the soil for a very long time, have important roles to play in uh, soil texture uh, and other soil physical characteristics. And then, as I'll be mentioning here in a second, um, wood in soil provides an important substrate for those organisms that fix nitrogen. So, so the simple act of adding wood to a soil actually increases the potential for nitrogen fixation from those uh, bacteria that are able to do that. I'll talk about that more. So I'm not going to spend much more time on the physical and chemical benefits. Keep those in the back of your mind, however. I'm going to focus uh, for much of the rest of the talk on biological benefit. Um, these soil food webs, uh, soil biomass, organic matter, and nitrogen fixation. So collectively, these physical, chemical, and biological benefits support really um, healthy plant growth and enhance resistance to soil-borne pests and diseases, which uh, supports my contention that soil health should be an integral part of IPM uh, and strategies to manage pests and diseases, both above ground and below ground. Uh, and I just uh, make that point here because uh, sometimes uh, a talk like this um, is challenged by the folks that um, sort of certify these webinars for credit with regard to pesticide licensing recertification. Um, but uh, there's a clear linkage uh, in the science and in practice that um, healthy soils promote healthy plant growth and actually help you manage diseases and pests. So if uh, wooden soil it's such a great idea. Why isn't everybody like doing it, right? Why isn't everybody like adding wood as a soil amendment when they can? Well, I think um, it all comes back to a myth that we, um, most of us, uh, live with. And it's this myth of never mixing wood into the soil because it'll rob soil nitrogen. So before uh, the demic, I was, uh, I was taking this uh, presentation on the road a lot, and so I had a lot of feedback from my audiences about it. And um, uh, the uh, the persistence of this myth is pretty remarkable. Even people that don't really have an interest in like gardening or understanding ecosystems have this myth in their their playbook. I'd give this presentation, and at the end of the presentation, people would come up to me and they'd say, "Are you sure if you uh, incorporate wood chips, they're not going to steal the nitrogen?" And so um, there's just a, a very high bar um, to get over if you are attempting to talk about soil, um, uh, wood, uh, and this depletion of nitrogen that happens. So the, uh, the myth sort of goes like this. If you mix wood into the soil, it'll rob soil nitrogen. It basically creates a soil nitrogen deficit that ad adversely affects plant growth. And uh, I don't deny that that's a phenomenon that happens. Um, if you incorporate abundant carbon-rich material, such as sawdust or sugar, into the soil, you get this temporary um, proliferation of soil microbes that just want to eat that sawdust or sugar. And all of the population growth of those microbes um, temporarily robs the soil of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to the detriment of the plants you're trying to grow in those soils, right? So I'm not denying that that um, phenomenon actually exists. However, I think it's important to be a, a little more precise about when that phenomenon happens. And in fact, uh, I'll just point out that this phenomenon is used by some restorationists uh, in their restoration work uh, to assist in the establishment of native plants. It's a process called anti-fertilization as opposed to fertilization, where you actually try to tie up the uh, nutrients in the soil so that you um, um, basically promote native plant growth uh, at the expense of non-native or invasive plant growth. Um, the weed management tool, uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, not many people know about it, though. 
Um, basically what it does, uh, you basically dump sawdust or sugar into the soil. <clears throat> the populations of wee beasties that eat that stuff um, just go through the roof and, and create this nutrient unavailability. It's temporary, but that unavailability of uh, nutrients basically um, allows native plants, which don't require much um, nutrition compared to invasive species, a little uh, head start advantage if you're trying to get those native plants uh, established in an area where there's invasives or where there have been invasives. And if you use wood, uh, this simultaneously establishes uh, the basis for a, a robust soil uh, fungus uh, soil food web, which will subsequently support a healthy woody plant community that you're trying to restore to. So it's actually a technique that's used out there in restoration. But you know, in uh, my world, I'm not talking about sawdust. I'm talking about chips. So the phenomenon happens if you incorporate a material that has a very high surface area to volume ratio. And um, I hate to get into the geometry here, but um, let's just make the point that as the size of an object increases without changing shape, uh, that ratio of surface area to volume um, decreases. That is to say the volume increases much faster relative to surface area. So the the bigger you make a chunk of wood, uh, the less surface area it has relative to volume. That is to say there's less surface area for the wee beasties to get their mouths around. Uh, and thus, as a result, um, large pieces of material do not create this proliferation of wee beasties that want to eat it. Yeah, there are wee beasties that want to eat it, but um, compared to the uh, a material like sawdust, which has a high surface area to volume ratio, um, you just don't get the population booms that uh, you do get with sawdust if you're incorporating chips. So we're talking about chips here, not sawdust. So um, what is a wood chip? Let's explore that a little bit. Uh, you know, there are actually different kinds of wood chips. Um, around here, you can buy pure wood chips. Those are typically chipped western red cedar used for play areas and paving paths and that kind of stuff. Um, tend to be fairly expensive, and, you know, on the order of 40 to $50 a yard. Uh, and it seems an ignoble use of our iconic red cedar. Um, but if you can't get anything else, then pure wood chips um, would do. Well, Most available around uh, uh, urban locations uh, are arborist wood chips. So this uh, is um, a material that includes leaves, bark, stem wood, twig wood, materials uh, variable in size and decomposition rate. Uh, all of that stuff actually is good for creating a more diverse environment subsequently colonized by a diverse soil, soil biota. The uh, sort of the challenge with <clears throat> arborist wood chips is you're sort of at the mercy of the arborists, right? Uh, depending on what they're chipping any particular day. Um, it could be um, mostly this like large diameter stem wood, or it could be mostly leaves. Um, it's just really uh, highly variable material. If you're good though with plant identification, typically in a load of wood chips, you can identify what wood has been chipped, um, and you um, tend to want to go to um, arborist wood chips that have a mixture of leaves, bark, stem wood, and twig wood, right? Because you would like a little nutrient action in that material. And you also want to avoid um, wood chips, uh, arborist wood chips that have a lot of soil in them. Um, so the, at this point of uh, the presentation, um, the discussion often turns to, well, uh, what about soil-borne pathogens or um, diseases of the material that might be uh, chipped into that arborist wood chip? And I would say that, um, generally speaking, if you avoid arborist wood chips uh, that have soil in them, you don't want to have wood chips with soil because you do get uh, you do spread uh, soil-borne pathogens effectively that way. Um, mostly, uh, it's safe to use arborist wood chips, even if the, the plants that are being chipped are diseased. Uh, there are relatively few cases uh, that have been documented where uh, disease material has been um, uh, convected by arborist wood chips. Uh, there are a couple of um, uh, literature reviews that um, have evaluated this, and I would refer you to those um, reviews. Um, and by the way, this uh, presentation is available uh, should you want to have it. I also have a manuscript that uh, goes along with this presentation that includes uh, those references. So at the end of my talk, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my contact information. So feel welcome to reach out, and I'm happy to uh, provide those materials for you. 
Um, but safely speaking, I would say that arborist wood chips are an excellent material to use. They don't um, convey disease, um, even if the material that's being chipped is diseased. Um, most most plant diseases, as you, as you might know, require live tissue, and so as you chip up a plant, um, that material quickly dies and, and takes the uh, pathogens with it. Um, if you're uh, really uh, a connoisseur of wood chips, uh, you really are looking for ramial wood chips. Um, so ramial wood chips are just chipped twigs, not stem wood or trunks, less than seven centimeters in diameter. And the reason that you're interested in that is it's um, a more soluble or little polymer polymerized lignin. So it's actually much more digestible uh, lignin and cellulose than you find in a larger diameter or more woody material. And you also get more nutrients in the smaller material. So uh, more than 75% of nutrients, for example, are stored in twigs during the winter time. So if you can just get a, a, a batch of wood chips that are um, nothing but chipped twigs, uh, then you're doing really well. But typically that's uh, not uh, available on demand and you're pretty much uh, chipping your own if you want to have ramial wood chips. Generally speaking, any wood is good wood, as long as it's clean, not contaminated by salt or uh, wood preservatives or other contaminants, uh, and doesn't have soil in it. Generally good to go. Um, with regard to um, a natural model for wood chips, um, is there such a thing out there? And the answer is, yes, it's everywhere. Uh, anywhere that there is a forested environment, um, you have a great um, natural model for wood um, in soil. So you can imagine, uh, as you hike through this North Cascades forest here, um, that there is probably a, quite a bit of wood below ground, right? You've got this heavily forested ecosystem, lots of wood on the ground, standing dead and alive, but also a lot of wood on the ground dead. Um, but most people don't think about, well, gosh, you know, these trees have root systems. Um, I wonder how much of those plants are actually below ground. So obviously measuring the amount of um, wood uh, underground is difficult because it's obviously underground. Um, but we know that um, soils and forested ecosystems have much wood. Uh, we know that forests uh, across the globe have remarkable capacities to store carbon. Um, uh, so for example, tropical forests typically have the most robust carbon storage capacity on Earth on the order of um, like uh, 360 to 460 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per acre. Uh, compared to an average of about 230 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per acre for Pacific Northwest forest. However, um, some research uh, in some uh, old growth environments in the Northwest here uh, have demonstrated that carbon stocks exist of more than 900 metric tons per acre, which is pretty astonishing. So um, this is sort of the overall carbon storage that forests are capable of doing. The real question is how much of that is actually below ground? And um, difficult to measure, but some people have actually tried. And here's one example of that, um, where they actually um, excavated soil and uh, they measured all the roots that were larger than five millimeters in diameter. And they basically estimated for a variety of um, older Douglas fir communities how much wood was below ground. And what they found was that uh, um, typically about 20% of the wood in uh, these environments was below ground. You might expect more wood to be above ground, obviously, for their reasons, but uh, obviously plants that need to have root systems. So 20% um, uh, of a lot is a lot below ground. And so that's uh, my general point here is that um, if you go to an, a natural forested ecosystem, there's already um, a lot of wood underground um, benefiting in the ways that I've attempted to describe here. We know that uh, soils and forested ecosystems have much wood, and we know that soil food webs in those woody plant ecosystems are dominated by fungus. And for the reason that I mentioned earlier is that fungus is uh, the most efficient group of organisms on Earth capable of digesting wood for energy, it's an energy source. We also know that most of those fungi um, are mycorrhizal. And um, I'm presuming that um, uh, attendees today know what mycorrhizal fungi are. I don't have time to get into the details there, other than to um, explain that uh, mycorrhizal fungi are those fungi that associate with plant roots and provide uh, important benefits to those plants that they associate with. So this image here, this famous uh, image here, shows you a little seedling of a pine, the white 
um, roots here you see are the, the pine roots. And then all of these uh, grayer uh, filaments you see in this image are actually mycorrhizal fungi that are associating with these roots. And um, over uh, time, research has shown that mycorrhizal fungi basically expand the area available to uh, plant uh, the root area um, in terms of being able to scavenge moisture and nutrients on the order of 700 times. So a plant that's not associated with mycorrhizal has 700 times less the available soil area uh, available to it for um, nutrients and moisture. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi provide also a lot of other benefits, including um, protection against pathogens and uh, detrimental uh, organisms in the soil environment. The primary function of fungus in the soil food web appears to be wood decay. That is to say, most fungi are just sort of opportunistic when it comes to, uh, to forming my mycorrhizal re re relationships. Mostly the fungi are there because there's an abundance of wood as an energy source. <clears throat> um, this um, abundance of wood, though, as an energy source uh, results in the fact that um, you have huge um, uh, populations of fungus as uh, represented, represented in the soil food web. So it's on the order of 90% of the toil total um, biomass in forest soils being fungus. That's, that's huge. 90% of the, so the total biomass in forest soils being fungus, exceeding all other micro and meso organisms combined. Um, we just know that fungus are very important for uh, forest and ecosystem soil food webs. Um, we also know, uh, based on just very recent research, this is exciting, uh, gruesome, but exciting stuff. We know that fungi are carnivorous. They attack other organisms as sources of nitrogen to supplement a primarily carbohydrate diet, right? You can't live on wood alone. You need nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and all that other stuff to do your your daily um, chores. Um, we know the carbon to nitrogen ratio of wood is extremely high and nitrogen can be a limiting factor. So for uh, these decay fungi, predation of nematodes and other organisms adds extra protein, nitrogen, uh, to their systems and uh, basically allows them to live on uh, a source of uh, wood as an energy uh, source. Uh, nematode predation, although dramatic, and I'll show you why in a moment here, is less important than the ability of would decay fungi to, a back, to attack bacteria and other life forms as uh, nutrient supplements. Um, I'll mention that uh, fungi uh, hate bacteria and bacteria hate fungi. They have been antagonistic for uh, millions of years and it's basically um, chemical warfare um, that's uh, being engaged there. Uh, so fungus, obviously, uh, things like um, uh, well, you're familiar with some of the chemicals that fungus have uh, developed to attack bacteria. Bacteria have developed chemicals that attack fungus. And then fungus have a benefit, though, in that they are able to um, literally infiltrate um, and predate bacteria. What's, uh, what's notable, though, is uh, in this discussion is that um, all of these phases of fungus, whether they're being predatory uh, or parasitic, uh, saprophytic decaying wood or mycorrhizal, um, they're doing all of these phases at the same time and um, uh, they're all critical to the success of fungi and soil food webs. So here are the uh, images that I was suggesting. So here in the upper left you see a nematode being captured by a fungus that has this um, curious circular appendage. When the nematode passes through that, the fungus senses uh, the nematode is present and these inflate basically capturing or trapping the nematode there. The fungus then infiltrates the nematode's body and slowly um, sucks out all the, the goodies within, including all the proteins and such. Uh, in the lower left here, you have a bacterium being infiltrated by fungus. And then uh, a pretty remarkable story that uh, comes out of um, the uh, old growth pine forests of Michigan. Uh, Chloronymos and Hart um, were doing studies of uh, how nitrogen entered and then cycled through those ecosystems. And they, they in their model, discovered uh, that their model completely underestimated, substantially underestimated the amount of nitrogen that was present in those ecosystems. So they had their model. They would go into the ecosystems and measure the nitrogen present in the old white pines that were there. And their model consistently underpredicted that. So they, they were missing something. So they went back to the drawing board and they discovered 
that the mycorrhizal um, fungi that were associated with those old pines were trapping very large numbers of columbola, or springtails, which is an ancient insect, and that's what's illustrated here, basically uh, entombing them and then basically keeping them alive in stasis, but slowly um, drawing out the, um, the proteins and uh, nutrients that are found in those columbola bodies. Which is a pretty remarkable thing. Chloronimals and Hart estimated that um, up to about 25% of the nitrogen in those old pines came from meat. Puts an interesting spin on uh, our definition of carnivorous plant, right? Um, now, at this point, you might be saying to yourself, Clay, that reminds me of an X-Field uh, or X-File um, episode. And in fact, you're correct. Um, that would have been, uh, what it, uh, it's uh, an episode called Field Trip. It was the 21st episode of season six where uh, uh, Mulder and Scully were actually uh, being uh, held captive, entombed below ground by an alien fungus-like organism and their bodies slowly being drained of nutrients and other goodies. Um, so uh, drama here repeated uh, in the real world there. Um, it's brutal, I tell you. Uh, it's brutal in that soil food web, dog eat dog, whatever you gotta do to survive. Um, another very interesting thing about soil uh, and wood in soil is that um, there's lots of nitrogen fixing bacteria in soil. Uh, some of those bacteria um, actually live in uh, plant roots, and so most of us are familiar with that, and those are known as symbiotic diazotrophs, if you're looking for the terminology. Um, so for example, in this image here, these are the nodules on the roots of alder um, that uh, inhabit, uh, are inhabited by Frankia, um, and you got rhizobium for Scott's broom and other legumes and that kind of stuff. So we know about these organisms that live in association with plant roots, but there's also lots of organisms that are able to fix nitrogen, bacteria, we're talking about here, diazotrophs, that don't live in association with plant roots. Um, and in a variety of different genera of um, bacteria. Uh, these bacteria must find their own substrate. And that, that substrate tends to be wood and source of energy, uh, typically oxidizing organic molecules released by other organisms or decompose, decomposing that soil organic matter, that wood. Um, so the idea here is that um, if you um, put wood into soil, you're providing a substrate and energy source for nitrogen-fixing bacteria, thus increasing the populations of those nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which actually add more nitrogen uh, as opposed to stealing nitrogen from soil food webs. Um, you know, until recently, people have thought that they, uh, uh, the nitrogen fixation rates in soil has been pretty minor. Uh, but recent studies uh, based uh, on some newer technology allowing us to actually measure what's going on below ground have demonstrated that's not the case, that in fact sometimes this nitrogen fixation can be very substantial. There's one Australian study that um, determined an intensive wheat rotation farming system um, provided uh, 30 to 50 percent of the total needs of the crop um, through nitrogen fixation, free living nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria. Uh, maintaining that wheat stubble and reduced tillage in this system provided the necessary high carbon, low nitrogen environment to optimize these uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, and a little closer to home here, if you look at um, forests in the Pacific Northwest, um, some research in unmanaged second growth, uh, western hemlock and Pacific silver fir and western red cedar, uh, western hemlock old growth forest on Vancouver Island. Uh, demonstrated that nitrogen fixation ranged from 0.9 to almost two pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, which uh, in a natural forest ecosystem is really humongous. That is a uh, an important contribution of nitrogen uh, in ecosystems that are often nitrogen limited. So um, what we're finding is that nitrogen fixation by these free living um, uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria is um, contributing potentially large volumes of nitrogen to uh, the nitrogen, nitrogen cycle in uh, soil food webs. Uh, and part of promoting that kind of nitrogen fixation is providing the substrate on which these bacteria do their work. 
So I just uh, want to make sure that you don't think this is just uh, something that Clay came up with uh, uh, randomly. Now, there are actually a lot of uh, good examples out there in the real world demonstrating the benefit of wood chips as a soil amendment. And I'll mention uh, three examples here, and then you can um, follow up with uh, 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 these uh, examples on your own time. Um, I'll just mention the uh, the main one, which is whole orchard recycling. This is a, a new technique, actually. So when it comes time in these places where they uh, they grow orchards, so we're talking primarily places like the Central Valley of California and pecan country of Georgia, New Mexico, and Texas. When it comes time to to renovate an orchard, um, traditionally what they would do is um, doze out all of the old trees, uh, put them in big piles, and then burn them. Uh, and that is increasingly difficult to do these days because of concerns about pollution. Uh, and often these areas are close to urban areas, and so there's um, lots of um, regulation now that is uh, affecting that tradition of burning um, former orchard trees. So people have been looking for an alternative to burning. And um, uh, what they have decided on, uh, particularly in California, where this is now a growing um, trend, is basically to uh, uh, dig out the trees, doze them out, pile them up, and then basically uh, grind them into chips and then incorporate those chips. Uh, and so uh, this is a, an example of that. So a couple of researchers there, uh, University of California, Holtz and Dole, have done a lot of work here and uh, have published on this. Um, they have found a uh, great benefit to doing this practice. Uh, and in fact, I'll just quote here from one of their publications. Traditionally, many growers feared that wood chips or grindings would stunt tree growth by either allelopathic compounds or reduce nitrogen availability, dealing nitrogen, uh, due to the high carbon-nitrogen ratio. Recent research has found this not to be true if the ground material is spread across and incorporated into the soil. So um, what they're finding down there is exactly what I'm, I'm suggesting uh, is beneficial. This is how they do it. This is one of the um, uh, tools they use. It's called an iron wolf. Um, masticator, they just basically run that over the trees, grind it into wood chips, uh, and then they uh, till that into the uh, orchard to be uh, to be renovated. Multiple benefits to soil physical, biological, and chemical properties. The only draw drawback is that it's expensive because it involves equipment and personnel, but uh, what they're finding is that um, there is not a downside. Uh, the soil analysis uh, in these research efforts uh, show significantly more nutrients. Um, better electro electrical conductivity, organic matter, total carbon, uh, reduced pH. Uh, there's stimulated microbial activity. There's greater yields. Uh, there's more nutrients in the new orchard that's planted, less salt burn and less wilting. So um, they're finding down there in California in whole orchard recycling is um, nothing but benefit of incorporating wood into soil. Another real-world example is hurricane storm cleanup. So after hurricanes go through an area or a derecho, some sort of massive event that destroys trees, you can imagine the uh, cleanup problems that that causes. Um, so traditionally, um, they would co-mingle um, the wood with all of the other crap that uh, was a result of the devastation there, and they landfill it. People began to realize that that's uh, sort of not a, probably a good thing to do, and it's expensive to do. So why not take that organic material, grind it up, and find a use for it? And what they're finding uh, is that um, uh, it's very useful to sell to farmers, or in some cases they pay farmers to actually apply these wood chips uh, to the fields, and those farmers are finding the benefits that I'm describing to you. Typically, the wood is uh, ground up by these um, modern uh, horizontal grinders, which are amazingly high volume, rapid things. Uh, they grind huge um, volumes uh, of large diameter stuff faster than that material can be loaded. Pretty, pretty amazing stuff if you start investigating that online. Uh, and then lastly, uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about hugo culture. So if you're a permaculturist, um, by now you're, you're probably saying to yourself, Clay, tell me something I don't know. Here's a technique that's been around for hundreds of years. This is a technique uh, that permaculturists use these days. Basically, it's involving digging trenches or pits and then filling those trenches and pits with wood, uh, large diameter, small diameter stuff, and then burying that wood so that you end up with a raised bed 
That raised bed is designed to hold moisture, build fertility, maximize growing surface, and encourage soil food webs that are diverse and healthy. Great spaces for growing fruits, vegetables, and herbs. So uh, the uh, point here is um, wood in soil has been known to be beneficial for um, many years. It seems to have gone off the radar uh, for most practitioners. It's time, I think, to uh, realign ourselves and get back on track with regard to the benefits that wood offer us as a, a soil amendment. I'll just uh, briefly mention my own experience, how I came to discover the utility of wood chips as a soil amendment. As a, as a forest steward in the city of Seattle, I worked at Discovery Park, uh, and um, forest stewards basically adopt an area and then uh, gradually work to remove invasive plants and plant native desirable vegetation. You might know that Discovery Park, the city's largest park, um, used to be a military installation, and virtually every square foot of it was developed uh, for an aspect of that military installation. So roads, um, buildings, um, uh, parade grounds, uh, just uh, every square foot. Uh, living with a legacy of having been uh, denuded of the original forest vegetation and then basically converted to an intensive military use. One of the areas that I worked in uh, is shown here. So this is the area that I work in and you can see that I plant individual plants. Each one of these little specks here is an individual plant. This is what it looked like, this area looked like in 1936. <clears throat> there was a munitions um, bunker here. There was a road uh, and then there was a building here. Not exactly sure what that was all about, but you can see that um, what looks sort of like a pasture or meadow at this point, um, uh, maybe without any kind of previous past land use, was actually um, uh, pretty intensively used by the military there. So as I dig, I dig these planting pits for my trees and shrubs, you know, I am routinely looking at pretty much dead soil. It's basically a sand pit. Um, so the, the, the geologic strata at Discovery Park are advanced glacial outwash layers, mostly um, pretty well sorted sands, but basically a big sand box. And as I dig my plant planting holes, um, I would routinely discover that the plant Planting the soil that I was planting in was dead. There was no evidence of life. There was, for example, no mycelial activity. There were no earthworms, no insects, essentially no organic matter. One day I was um, sitting there um, digging holes uh, and uh, digging holes and planting as I usually did. So my technique would be to dig a hole about two feet wide, about a foot and a half deep. And uh, uh, then I would basically plant my plant and then use a five gallon bucket of wood chips to mulch around that plant. And then I would move on to the next one. But one day as I was digging my hole and noting that there was just no life in the soil that I was working with, it occurred to me that perhaps I should use this five gallon bucket of wood chips I was gonna use for mulch, I should just dump it into the hole and see what happened. Uh, I don't know why this came to me, but it just did. Um, and I basically began to change my planting technique based on that uh, revelation. So um, a two foot diameter hole, one and a half foot deep, uh, a one gallon, excuse me, a five gallon bucket, which holds about one gallon of wood chips, by the way. Um, I dump that into the hole. I mix that wood chip into the hole, and then I basically plant backfill with my side cast material. After I noticed, uh, after I did this for a, a single growing season, I noticed immediately that there was a benefit in doing so, and, and in particular, I noticed that um, the plants that were treated in this way had improved plant vigor and growth. They had reduced need to irrigate, uh, and there were signs of life, more importantly, in the soil food web. And what I mean by that is that mushrooms appeared uh, the following fall. And as I dug into those soils um, in which I had amended with soil, uh, with the wood chips, I noticed that those wood chips were covered with mycelium, uh, and there was just um, good evidence that things were beginning to happen down there. And so. I changed my technique, and this is what I do now, and uh, it has uh, basically transformed how I uh, practice as a restorationist as well as a gardener in my own garden and in commercial um, and uh, municipal garden settings. This is my method, uh, and again, I'll be able to pass this along to you if you have an interest in uh, knowing about this. Um, generally speaking, what we're talking about here is adding wood chips as a soil amendment. And uh, I've been trying to convey to you that um, 
there are many benefits to doing so. We know that losses in plant productivity are closely linked to um, depleted soil or organic matter, compaction, and depleted soil food webs. We're talking about the coarse wood component of soil. Uh, decay of that wood is slow. The beneficial effects may last for decades or centuries. There's really very little research uh, around um, using wood in soils in this way. Restoring natural levels of coarse wood uh, into soil horizons might be an intensely long-term process. And we also know that we don't know a lot. Um, it's complicated. Um, but we do understand, I do understand from my own experience, that greater strategic use of wood chips in ecosystem restoration and ornamental landscaping has the potential to importantly transform uh, these industries here and elsewhere, uh, even as it has transformed my own restoration and thinking. So with that, I'll just say that um, some of the literature that I've cited in my presentation is presented here and here. Did you get that? And here. Um, and obviously, you probably want a PowerPoint um, or a PDF of this presentation if you want to follow up on any of that. But anyway, this is how you can reach me. And I am happy to answer questions and respond to comments. So I'm going to turn it back to you all. Great. Thank you so much, Clay. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to go. Like everyone is finished, I'm going to close the poll now. And I'm going to pass it over to Joe for questions. OK, thank you, Paris. Hi there, Clay, and thanks for that presentation. Um, we have a lot of questions, so let me jump into that. One that came up during the last presentation um, uh, angled at wood chips uh, was aging wood chips to prevent weed seed distribution. Does that, does it follow to season your chips before incorporating them into the soil, or is that counterproductive? Yeah, so um, that uh, usually comes up in this presentation. So generally, the seasoning wood chips is a desirable practice if you can do it. Obviously, not everybody has the space or time to do that. Um, seasoning allows you to, to achieve a couple of things. First, it um, allows you to make sure that there are actually no diseases um, that might be transmitted by the wood chips. So. Um, as I mentioned, most diseases require living tissue, and so if you can age wood, um, those diseases tend to um, peter out, disappear. Um, and then you also have, uh, you know, this um, thing about um, wood chips being uh, a medium for transmitting weed diseases. So if you actually have piles of wood chips sitting around, um, if there are weed seeds, they can sprout, and you can identify if that's uh, the case there. Uh, the danger of seasoning, though, is sometimes uh, those piles actually accumulate weed seeds from uh, surrounding vegetated areas, so you might want to be a little cautious there. Um, I, I would say that um, that would be the ideal case. I wouldn't season them too long because you actually want those chunks of wood to be working in the soil profile uh, rather than on top of the ground. Um, so I would say, you know, on the order of uh, a year, uh, seasoning should be sufficient. Uh, and then it's time to get those chips uh, underground and working to build a soil food web there. Okay, thank you. One year. Uh, well, that kind of jumps into a question which came later, but uh, someone asked if the chips are 50% composted, does this adversely affect their effectiveness? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think that that affects their adversely affects their uh, effectiveness. Again, the, uh, one of the benefits of having a whole wood chip uh, underground is that it provides an energy source um, in the soil food web. So if you're composting wood chips above ground, you're doing a, a much different thing than as if you're composting them or degrading them below ground, right? You're feeding the soil food web below ground. Um, but that said, um, you know, any wood is good wood, whether it's um, completely sound new wood chip or 50% composted. So um, I I don't intend to discourage anybody from uh, incorporating any wood into the soil, even if it's um, partly digested already. Okay. Um, in regards to anti-fertilization, um, <clears throat> how long would you have to wait before nitrogen levels become more hospitable to natives? I think they meant versus invasives. 
<laughs> yeah, so um, it's amazing how quickly these populations of mostly bacteria um, rise to the occasion once they're given uh, something to eat. So if you dump sawdust or um, sugar into the soil as part of an anti-fertilization technique, um, the effect is nearly instantaneous. Um, the beasties just uh, go nuts and uh, you can begin to plant immediately into that. The native plants that you uh, want to have a head start advantage. Um, so as those populations of wee beasties increase, the uh, amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other things begin to decrease, giving the advantage to native plants and the disadvantage to invasive species. That effect uh, it depends a lot on the volume of sawdust or sugar that you use, but uh, generally speaking, that effect of temporary soil theft, uh, soil nitrogen theft, um, is on the order of like five to seven years. So at the end of five to seven years, the wee beasties have pretty much consumed all the sawdust or sugar and their populations are plummeting. And as those bodies die, then those nutrients become available again and you're sort of back to where you started. Okay, that's, that's a lot longer than I would have suspected. Thank you. Um, someone asked about nematodes. So if you know you have a nematode problem, could you use wood chips to help this? Yeah. You know, uh, this whole thing about fungus being carnivorous um, is really a critical piece of information for combating soil pathogens like nematodes. Uh, there's actually a lot of uh, published research about um, how uh, soil fungi predate nematodes, and they do a lot of it. It's, it's large. It's huge. It's a, an important uh, relationship in soil food webs that fungus consume nematodes. And so you can actually use this strategy, incorporating wood chips, as a way to promote uh, the biological control of nematodes, if you will, uh, using fungus. So I would um, turn you to some of that research that has uh, documented just how uh, frequently and the methods by which fungus actually predate nematodes. Uh, I'd say that, uh, yeah, a, a healthy soil food web has uh, nematode populations uh, under management, so to speak. Okay, there's a question. Um, is there any difference with added wood in drier areas other than the wood lasting longer in the soil? Uh, a good question. Yeah, so um, in drier areas. So you, you might be referring to areas like maybe in eastern Washington. Um, you know, I guess I don't have a, a good response to that. Uh, obviously, soil food webs require moisture to function well. Um, and um, I would say that this technique probably is a little more efficient in moisture areas than drier areas, but um, it would be important wherever you're attempting to grow woody plant material, um, whether it's dry or moist. Well, maybe that's not a good answer, but um, I think wood is critical wherever you are if you're trying to uh, garden with or restore a woody plant uh, community. And one I almost missed, would you, um, do you have any research or experience with um, use in a vegetable garden? Is there any different effect? Yeah, so this is a technique actually, uh, and I noticed another comment here, and so I'm, Joel, I'll, I'm just gonna go ahead and address this one question go, with regard to forward. cultivating soil. So um, if I'm suggesting to you that wood chips can be used as a soil amendment, I'm, I'm suggesting that you're cultivating soil, right? Um, you're tilling it up to incorporate the wood chips. And um, you, most of you probably have heard that um, tilling soil is dramatically harmful to soil food webs um, in terms of disrupting, say, my, mycorrhizal networks, um, uh, depleting uh, soil organic matter, uh, all sorts of stuff. There's a, a cascade of um, adverse effect in cultivating soil. So that's why there's an emphasis these days in, in agriculture in minimizing tillage or even going to say no-till systems. So this technique um, is important for areas that require help, right? And so I'm not advising that uh, you go into a healthy um, landscape uh, or um, an environment and basically begin tilling up the root zones of healthy plants. 
But obviously, there are places and times where you need to go in um, because there's ex extensive uh, soil compaction or you have dead uh, soil food webs where you need to actually intervene uh, in, that, in a sort of an extreme way. And you do that using this technique of digging wood chips into the soil. You know, if you're working with a natural ecosystem uh, that's doing pretty well, um, then wood chips as a mulch is a great way to go. Uh, I don't advise disrupting um, root zones uh, in places where you don't have to. So this is a technique really that's um, more remedial than anything. Um, you're really trying to get things kick-started uh, when they're dead uh, or resolve soil compaction issues. This is a technique also that's not really adaptable to vegetable gardening. Um, vegetables uh, and vegetable gardening really do require cultivation of soils, typically. Uh, and I found in my own garden that wood chips sort of get in the way of that. Uh, they don't hurt, but um, generally, if you're trying to grow uh, herbaceous vegetable stuff, you're more interested in high levels of organic matter that might be derived from bacteria. And that's where compost comes in. So compost, as opposed to uh, wood chip, is derived primarily from bacterial decomposition of organic matter, not, my, not uh, mycorrhizal or, or fungal decomposition. Right, and so when you buy cedar grove compost, for example, it's, that's primarily a bacterial product. That is great stuff for enhancing organic matter, particularly in settings that require uh, frequent cultivation, like vegetable gardens. Um, so I would advise using a compost product to amend vegetable gardens uh, and avoid the wood chips. Um, you know, because with wood chips, you're really promoting a a fungus-based soil food web, and if you're constantly churning the soil, then you're constantly disrupting that fungus-based soil food web. It's better just to use compost and use uh, that as a way to increase your soil organic matter and uh, add additional nutrients and so forth. So hopefully that, uh, that explanation is clear and gets to this idea of am I recommending cultivating places that um, already have healthy, healthily established woody plants. Okay, thanks for that. Now, there's a question here that gets at kind of the, the long, controversial topic of interfaces. Uh, it says, generally, we do not recommend amending the hole directly that a plant is being planted in as it creates a different growing environment. Have you seen any long-term changes in the plant roots, such as girdling, where chips have been added? Yeah, so in, you know, my, in my restoration work, I'm I'm pretty much stuck to having to uh, dig in pretty much dead soils and um, uh, because I don't have good access to water, for example, and I don't have a lot of time for maintenance, um, pretty much the plants are on their own. So I, I'm looking for techniques that allow me to um, basically minimize my effort, the need to irrigate, for example, or maintain, and maximize the plant's effort to uh, do what it has to do, survive. So um, in my uh, method, I'm basically incorporating wood into the native soil. Um, I am decompacting uh, the planting hole uh, and, and including a lot of organic material there. What I found, though, is that, um, you know, I find the plants are actually well-rooted beyond uh, the planting hole that I've dug in. Um, the wood chips act to establish the um, basic uh, soil uh, the, oh, the basic fungus-based soil food web. And then uh, the idea is that those fungus find the roots of the plants that I've planted and become mycorrhizal with those roots. Um, over the years, um, I've been doing this since about 2010, uh, the plants that have uh, succeeded with this um, technique compared to the plants that were planted without that technique um, are visually um, much more impressive in terms of their vigor and size. And so I haven't dug any, any of them up, but I'm presuming that they are now well beyond my planting hole uh, and that, you, that, I, that I haven't created this interface issue that you're um, mentioning. Now, I also am working in sandy soils that are highly permeable. Uh, generally speaking, they're mostly compacted, but they're also relatively permeable, say, compared to a clay soil. Um, and so this technique I've not used actually in heavy soils, uh, and you might actually encounter that interface problem uh, in using this technique with um, heavy clay soils. However, again, if you're constrained by um, resources like irrigation uh, and time for maintenance, 
I would say that um, promoting a healthy soil food web uh, is a great uh, and important step forward in getting those plants to be uh, successfully established. And I wouldn't worry about the interface issue too much. Okay, great. Thank you, Clay. I appreciate your answers there. Um, and with that, we'll end our Q&A, and I will send it back to you, Kate. Great. Thank you so much, Clay and Joel. And thank you also to the rest of our presenters.